Hello and thank you very much for listening to this level of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. I appreciate you guys checking this episode out. I uh, am out here at the Wildlife Refuge. I'm recording some uh, some stuff out here. I've been trying to do some, vid- some video and some photo stuff while I'm out here. And what's cool is the, uh, the Canadian geese have, uh, have started to make their migration down to the area. So this, uh, this region that has the wetlands over here, I guess why it was... It was made into being a, a wildlife refuge. Um, has elk in it. Has like a herd of elk that comes through in winter in this area, and then it also has uh, like a ton of um, of wetland out here where a bunch of geese and uh, egrets and um, different birds come through. There's like a bunch of hawks I saw out in this field. There's uh, there's eagles, like bald eagles, that come through in a pretty high number. I think a little later in the year, or kind of kind of like in uh, like January, and February, and March is when I see them out here, like down in those fields. I think I maybe talked about it last year, where these uh, this this field, you know, you just see like six or seven bald eagles floating out in the line of trees out by the creek side, and then they would kind of come out, fly around, kind of be competitive with each other, sort of do loops around each other, try and get uh, carrion that had I don't know been left out in the field somewhere. So it's kind of weird to see like uh, how these birds kind of act and how they operate and stuff. But that's cool about uh, coming out of this wildlife refuge area. It's really not too far from uh, from the downtown area of where I'm living. And uh, just a couple of minutes outside of it, you can hop over and uh, check out some wildlife stuff. I haven't seen any elk out yet today. Um, I have recently, but I thought that I'd see them out here when I was driving around and I uh, haven't been able to spot any. I bet it's kind of one of those things if you're out here for the full day, like either uh, you know dawn till dusk, you'll probably come up across more than if you're just driving through in the afternoon but it's cool yeah a lot of a lot of noisy birds out there a lot of noisy geese and stuff that i'm hearing out on the uh on the wetland and stuff but it was cool earlier i was driving and i saw a coyote it wasn't a very big one he was probably like i don't know maybe 30 pounds or so maybe 20 30 pounds but he seemed like a i mean it was, it was in there but uh it still seemed like a, a pretty small little critter it's kind of fun though yeah he's a, a bright eyed kind of fluffy has a winter coat kind of perked up and uh, yeah it was a coyote he ran across the street kind of right out in front of me about I don't know, 50 60 feet or so and then posted up about 15 feet off into the the brush and the forest on the side and then uh, kind of pointed his ears up and then looked over at me and was kind of trying to scope me out and so i threw a couple coyote whinnies at him a little woo 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 trying to sound like a coyote at him and then he kind of looked uh inquisitively at me like what what is going on am i supposed to talk to this guy and so then he uh started trotting off and then i hooted at him again and then he turned around and looked at me and then he was like ah, i had enough of this guy and then he he started to take off but yeah saw a coyote out here kind of hanging out as uh going about his coyote business this afternoon but it's kind of cool getting to come out and check out the uh the stuff of the wildlife refuge so I don't know. Maybe we'll see some of the cool stuff out here, but it's cool coming out here, checking out the Canadian geese and their their migration down, and uh, kind of seeing like, I guess how uh, the different birds and stuff come through, and sort of how they use this landscape throughout the different parts of the year. I think that there's some hunting opportunities out here. Like I was just reading a sign that said like, there's a couple uh, elk tags available for um, management of this wildlife refuge area and its region. I think there's like, I don't know, five or 10 tags a year or something to, uh, to hunters that want to do a uh, hunt on this land. And then I think there's like some other kind of discreet, uh, bird hunting opportunities to happen out here too, which sounded uh, kind of interesting. I just bought a, a recreation pass the other day. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Like a, um, I don't know, like a U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife or U.S. Forest Service Recreation Pass is the one that I bought. I think it was thirty bucks. I was kind of looking around at it, going, "Oh, is this the one I needed to get?" I'm not sure. Maybe I'll focus in on just getting my uh, my fishing and hunting license next time. I think that would probably give me more uh, more opportunities, you know. Um, but that's what I was trying to kind of figure out when I was looking at. It. I was like, "Oh, what does this give me access to?" I think I thought it was going to give me access to more of the um, like. I don't know, the, the Forest Service campground locations that are in Oregon and Washington that, uh, that try and make you pay some day use fee, you know, some nominal 3 or $5 fee. So I was trying to get like the, the, the fee for the year to sort of give me coverage for it, at least to like a couple of these little fishing spots that I go to that, uh, that have like a pullout in a bank. And I think they ask you to pay to park when you're there. But uh, I'm hoping that, yeah, the, the recreation pass sort of covers me for some of the, some of the drop-ins that I was going to plan on doing. In those locations, it's cool though. It lasts, I guess, the entire year. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So instead of like my fishing license, I think if I bought one today, it would it would expire uh, December thirty first, and then I'd have to get a new one January first. But 
Um, but with this one, yeah, I bought this recreation pass in December, I guess, because it, it'll expire still December 31st, 2021. So at the end of next year, it'll uh, it'll wrap up. But I guess it'll give me, uh, you know, access to get onto a couple of the Forest Service properties that, that do charge day use fees. I think, though, a lot of the day use fees that I do often run into are managed by the state agencies. So I think that's like a state parks kind of thing that I think you can also get get a parking pass for, get a permit for, for some of those beach access spots along the coast uh, that they, that I think they're out there. But, uh, but I don't think that this one covers any of that stuff. So I don't know. I might, uh, I might've just uh, given the forest service department 30 bucks for just about no reason. So we'll see if it, uh, if it comes into being anything cool for me for the year. But I was uh, looking at this article that had kind of popped up and it, it sort of uh, had been, relative to some stuff that I had done. So I was going to mention it, but uh, it was sort of talking about how uh, everything now after the COVID-19 pandemic stuff is sort of throwing everything upside down. There's a lot of work from home stuff. And then there's uh, also like a lot of I don't know, displacement and stuff out of the cities and stuff. So, uh, so something I was hearing about and uh, something that I've guess I've kind of done before is a, uh, I guess there's a sort of a resurgence in or at least there's been an uptick, I think, you know, over the last 15 years of people trying to do nomad work or, you know, trying to do uh, work from home. But now it's work from your car, work from anywhere that you are sort of stuff. And that's what's kind of cool about having an Internet anywhere connection that you'd have with your cell phone or, um, you know, with uh, some of the data connectivity that you get to have now. You get to be within uh, 15, you know, 12 hours or I guess you could say 24 hours at any time of, of having a, a data connection where you can get internet access or, or get connection out to other people and stuff if you need to for, I guess, work-related services, which is kind of the benefit there. If you're not doing um, some sort of manual labor labor work that's sort of like a, a, a service work like that where you're actually like uh, doing something out in the woods where you can be outside and, uh, and be away from stuff. If you want to, I guess, still kind of uh, report back to stuff, it's kind of nice that you, you have those options now to be anywhere that you want to. So I guess some people are taking these work from home opportunities and then getting in their car, rigging up and then taking off uh, and kind of hiding out in some of the, the more dispersed regions that we have around here. I think there's uh, some of that stuff where you can still do. Uh, well, like, there's a lot of travel stuff you get to do right now outside of uh, what's deemed essential. Even during like periods of lockdown, you can still do some interstate travel. And especially if you're not going into um, other towns or uh, a lot of other like municipal services and so even not going into different stores and stuff when you get there using hotels or I think like there's like restrictions on certain types of tourism but there are, is not yet restrictions on uh, certain types of outdoor recreation activities or outdoor uh, management activities like I think if you're doing hunting trips and all that sort of stuff it's still the same but um, but what I've been hearing is yeah that now people are sort of freed from some of the responsibilities of being tied down to an office job in a urban city center system they've uh, kind of taken up um doing some some van life trips or some road trips or some um some work as a nomad at trips which uh, i've always thought was kind of cool that's sort of um that's sort of what i was interested in way back when i was trying to get set up to do some extended travel through 2011 and 2012 and i've tried to do some of that stuff uh, kind of continuing on from them but since then it's really only been like I don't know, four or five day trips or maybe a 10 day trip or something like that in there. And, and then I try and come back and then sort of reset, um, reset the gear and the equipment I have and then go back out again for some other stuff or go back to work or whatever it is. So, um, so that's kind of the way that it's been happening the last couple of years, but it was really cool, I guess, kind of getting to do that during that period because I had a similar, like an opportunity where I could, um, I could keep my money going and submit my work for a period of time while I was out traveling around on the road. And I'd heard about, heard about this, I think, from someone that had uh, like selected to take like a only online classes. While I was back in college, someone had selected to take only online classes for a term. And then they, I guess, decided to live in their car and go rock climbing, you know, at a couple of different spots in Oregon and Arizona and New Mexico or something like that. So they just went on some rock climbing trip and then they'd stop in at uh, at some little beach town Starbucks and drop off their uh, their term papers or whatever it was through the year. I'm sure they didn't do great in school, uh, but it also seemed like a cool opportunity. You know, if you wanted to do your spring term, take online classes, live in your car, kind of with your, sleeping in your trunk of your car, and then uh, submitting your your online classes from your laptop or over your cell phone as you uh, connect to the internet, and then dip out and then go back to your your dirt bag lifestyle, doing some rock climbing, hiking stuff. And some of the public land, National Forest Service stuff that we've got around. 
So it seemed kind of like a cool idea, and I'd heard about it then. That's sort of uh, one of the things that got me interested in trying to set up my car, and you know, I just had like a little Camry at the time, so it wasn't really like rigged for uh, any overland expeditions. Um, but I tried to kind of set it up as best I could to be something that I'd, uh, I'd live out of for a while, or kind of do some extended travel with. So that uh, like first trip we did, you know, uh, I think like fifty fifty five days or something out on the road. And then, yeah, I was talking about work life and uh, working as a nomad, traveling around and uh, and doing some stuff um, out of your vehicle. My battery just got wiped out. So then I reset that. I'm still hanging out in the same spot, recording this podcast. But um, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of thrown from whatever I was talking about earlier. The uh, the van life stuff and working as a nomad out was uh, I was talking about being in college, uh, taking online classes and then. Um, going through and living out of your car as you're doing like rock climbing stuff at different places across uh, across national parks on the west coast seemed like kind of a, an interesting idea for something in college that's where i was trying to go through my, my toyota camry and uh, try and sort of build it out as something where i could uh, could go on a, an extended road trip and travel around to a lot of different places really like even with the two-wheel drive sedan access you have access to so many different natural uh, places out in the west it's really surprising you know all the different places you can get to i mean certainly like almost every trailhead system you can get to you know anything that isn't uh, like a high clearance four by four style drive or, or a road i mean you could you can really take any kind of car out there and even as it is i mean uh, even like slightly better car you know like all-wheel vehicle cars like uh like a subaru outback or something i've seen those go out over pretty wild and it, what seems like very rough roads. I don't know. I, I would probably try to avoid those kind of heavy roads and stuff if I were in, you know, such a small car like that. Even like a Toyota 4Runner or something, you know, like a, just like a, a pretty street ready uh, 4 by 4 vehicle, even though, you know, it's a 4Runner and it's sort of set up for that. Like if it's not really kind of especially equipped for that kind of travel, some of these roads that I've been on seem... Uh, way out of control for that but uh, but as it is like the Camry did a great job of getting me through almost every place that I was in uh, a lot of the time but man but I remember being really frustrated and I'm very happy now to have the the kind of high clearance that I have in the truck and probably why I'd never go back is I remember being out in a place uh, the Sailing Stones it's out in Death Valley a really cool kind of area to get to go out to I've seen plenty of pictures of it I was driving on my way out there in the Camry kind of taking our time and uh, the road got rough enough at just this type of grade where it was sort of sloped and rounded off as it kind of lifted I don't know maybe five or six feet but the angle of lift that it was in the road was sharp enough that I couldn't get the Camry over it without high centering the vehicle on that slope as it rounded off really frustrated by uh by how that worked if i just had like a little bit more clearance i could have hopped over that with no problem trucks and stuff they move over that without ever even really thinking about that as an issue but i'm sure smaller sedans have kind of clipped their uh <laughs> their differentials and stuff on those uh, kind of high center points a bunch of different times in the past and so it was weird yeah i was i was, I was there i was looking at it I was, I was assessing it in the car and i was thinking man there's no way or angle i can get this car kind of to creep around the side of this this piece here to get over it so that I can I can get to the other side. And we were so far out, you know, it just would have been terrible to puncture something or mess something up in the car. So we didn't get to go. It was terrible. But as we were out there, we saw like a, a family of, uh, you know, like five quads that kind of came through in a little group and they just kind of hopped right over and, and zoomed right past us without ever kind of a, a thought of it as a problem that would be sort of a, a trip ender if you were going out there. So it was, uh, it was cool to use the Camry to use kind of a smaller car like that. That's also, you know, the same as like people using a van or something like that. Vans aren't really like set up to do four-wheel drive, uh, off-road kind of carry stuff, but they are really great at getting you set up in a parking lot of a state-serviced area that or you know natural trailhead area that you can go out to and you can have your gear pretty well securely set up inside you can sleep inside when you want to and uh, for the people that are doing like the van life sort of dirt bag style stuff i think dirt bag comes from a kind of colloquial term of the the bag of chalk that rock climbers would carry if that sort of makes sense uh, i remember that as being kind of uh, one of the expressions of is uh, someone that was a uh, uh, a rock climber that would go to different sport climbing uh, sites and set up their gear and the ropes and then do climbs at you know smith rock or yosemite or wherever other places and in, in uh, california where that's uh sort of come into swing but it's cool that, uh, that that's a i don't know an avenue out there and stuff but uh but yeah i've, I've preferred the truck and the canopy system and stuff for a while i appreciated having like the forerunner for a while but i really appreciate having the the 
Oh, I guess a little bit more full size of a truck that's uh, still compact enough that you can kind of get over stuff and, and get in and out of tight spots pretty easily. Um, so it's kind of cool. And I don't really tow a lot of stuff or, or move a lot of other stuff around. When I was uh, doing some work before with a bunch of, um, of recreational vehicles, I remember part of the, the task was to do some photo and video projects uh, with some motor homes and like fifth wheels and trucks and trailers. And uh, those are kind of tricky because as I kind of started to find out, like when they wanted to do, I think they wanted to do some marketing stuff around that and like a ski resort. And so we had to go out and do some sort of snow photos around the ski resort. And they, I remember the drivers kind of looking at me like, you know, none of these vehicles are really designed to be off road or not even off road, but just like out in any, any form of snow or slickness or slush at all. Like it's really kind of set up to be sort of a dry weather driving vehicle. And a lot of times, I don't know what people in the Midwest or, or Northeast would say about that to have uh, RVs and fifth wheels, but also have to deal with sort of the inclement weather of winter a lot of the time. And uh, I wonder if the, the winterizing of those kind of things are a little bit different. And I figure as I've always heard from people, you know, they, they, they drive their, their two wheel drive cars around and, uh, six inches of fresh snow all the time or pack snow or whatever it is, but they seem to kind of still travel around through the winter way more than I'd ever feel comfortable doing. Um, but yeah, this driver that I was with, he was like, uh, I don't know, it was maybe an inch or so of snow on a paved road that was kind of going out to uh, a little, a little turnaround spot on a forest road. And uh, in the summertime, it'd be nothing, you know, it'd just be kind of packed with people going swimming and stuff. But in the winter, yeah, it was a, it was a snow covered road. And, and that driver did not want to be on there with any kind of trailer or truck or, uh, anything you know even with like a, a powerful truck or whatever it is it's just kind of like a weird kind of slick thing it's really heavy stuff moving on ice it's just never really um as secure or as good of an idea as uh, as what i'd want to try and commit to doing so that's kind of why like I, i'm really not that into um trying to carry or trying try to tow any big stuff i think it'd be cool though i guess like uh like a couple of my friends and stuff and sort of when i was doing the the raft guide stuff when I was doing the photography work for them, a lot of their transport equipment was, you know, vans with trailers that would carry their river equipment down to the river and back. So I could probably understand doing something more like that. If I was carrying a boat, there's like a smoke craft boat that I want to take out um, to this lake nearby. And I think that'd be pretty cool. It's a, it's a pretty cool, like uh, I think three seat, but it could probably fit five people in it. Um, sort of smoke craft fishing boat that I want to take out to a lake around here sometime and uh and do some fishing and that you know would require like a trailer and it would require towing it out there and stuff and i guess that's kind of different it's still sort of uh uh i don't know i guess more local travel you know you're not really trying to do like a van life road trip expedition that uh, some of the people in these fifth wheels that are, are doing long term and i think a lot of the time you know fifth wheels and campers and stuff they're they're sort of doing a um I guess it would be an RV park style trip, which is sort of the opposite of some of the stuff that I'd be trying to do where, uh, where I'm trying to, to stay more strictly in the BLM or, or National Forest Service land where you can camp for free or you can camp in a more dispersed way. And uh, you can also kind of uh, do some of, more of the wilderness experience stuff that I'm talking about and uh, I'm mostly more interested in. Uh, but there is a lot of road accessible stuff, even the spot that I'm at right now. I mean, you know, it's a, I'm right on a road. I'm at my truck right now and I'm looking out at a at a pond directly in front of me that's that's filled up with canadian geese and egrets and and goose and stuff so it's really cool uh, just to kind of hop over and get access to this kind of stuff without having to travel too far from your car but that's still a far cry different from the wilderness experience you get from an rv park that's a sort of more um i don't know urbanized civilized something like that it's it's a it's a pretty tight kind of compact area where you just sort of uh lined up in there and um, if you have a, if you have good opportunity or you know good locations that you're sort of set up with a with a vehicle like a fifth wheel, I think it's kind of cool. But man, there's just been so many times where I've been with people, even with pretty small like uh, 19 foot trailers, and you just can't get them backed up or turned around in the same kind of flexible way that you can with a uh, with a pickup truck or or a, you know an all terrain SUV or something like that. You can just kind of spin that thing around on a, a tighter forest service gravel road and then head back the other direction but if you're going up there with a truck and trailer you really have to have like a full turnaround system set up before you're kind of confident to to get back in there and then if you come up across um like a washout or you know some kind of drainage problem in the road or just a big ditch or bump or something like that you got to worry about i don't know kind of a number of different things that just sort of make uh you know make travel around with a trailer in that way a little bit more tricky um but people have gotten used to it and have a lot of skill with it. And I bet if you're driving around a truck and trailer and stuff, then you probably probably know what risks you're uh, you're into or or not willing to take when you're doing it. But it's kind of cool, yeah. The van life stuff. I was thinking about 
those travels uh, that I had done before and some of the kind of backpacking stuff that I'd added into that where it was sort of a mix between um, between backpacking wilderness travel that I would do every couple of days, but and then also a lot of uh, car camping travel. And then also kind of a little bit of an edge of, uh, of like going into an urban area and either getting a hotel or, you know, sleeping in the car uh, in a middle class suburban neighborhood. That was a lot of it, too. So, yeah, van life. It's pretty fun. Yeah. So I kind of prefer to stay out in the uh, the wilderness area as opposed to uh, to kind of roam around in a uh, sort of suburban neighborhood and try and sleep in the trunk of my car it seems like uh it seems like kind of a weirder life to do that sort of a thing um so i like yeah heading out into eastern oregon and, and uh, kind of taking off and doing some wilderness stuff and being in the mountains and making a fire and all that instead of uh trying to hide out and camp in the back of my car and then leave early in the morning before too many people notice i've been there um, that was always kind of a stranger a stranger part of the uh the traveling camping wilderness experience when you're just kind of traveling around and you know sleeping in your car and then heading off to the next place in the in the, the next day or something you, know, you remember kind of pulling into some weird town outside of Yosemite after we'd been there and then just kind of sleeping in my car uh down at the bottom of the hill from Yosemite not in Fresno thank god and then <laughs> and then hitting, hitting the highway and then heading up and then uh, and then cutting over toward uh, Nevada I think from there is where we went but yeah I just remember like a couple of those days being kind of strange where you're just in some some little old gold miner town uh, setting up a sleeping bag in the back of your car to just kind of snooze after you went over to a shopping mart or you know some kind of grocery store to pick up a whatever <laughs> and put it in the jet boil and eat it and stuff so yeah I mean weird weird times out there on the road but I, I kind of want to get into that and, uh, and kind of do a breakdown of um, a couple of those trips and. Um, sort of some of the traveling stuff that I did week to week over there, and uh, and then some of the the photo stuff that I did along with it is kind of kind of fun, but um, but yeah, it's pretty cool uh, getting to talk about some of that, getting to see that coyote. That was pretty cool. Getting to talk about some uh, some nomad, how to live as a nomad stuff is pretty cool. I'll probably get into that more too. Some of the books and the resources and stuff that I tried to uh, to get into and cite when I was trying to figure out what the, what best options there were for me to get out and do some outdoor travel stuff. And it's kind of tough, you know. You want to you sort of you're interested in like oh like uh, camping or something or survival or photography or whatever it is, and then kind of like blending those together to feel you know like all right. So when you when you in a rush to get out into the wilderness or when are you kind of like coming back to just sort of do like a lighter in town uh, kind of camp out things. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Like I travel around like that is you go back and forth from needing a computer and power and an internet connection to also trying to get 15 miles deep into a wilderness area uh, where you can set up a camera and do some wildlife photography or some nature photography or some landscape photography. And then also kind of repeating that where you come back to a car where you have more services and data connectivity, and then you need to travel a long way. And then also, again, repeat the same process in that nomad style of, uh, you know, using the internet, using uh, or kind of getting your business done and uh, trying to be in contact with people to to kind of make some stuff happen and stuff. So that, that always kind of strange to sort of do that that number of different things and stuff. But also that's sort of what the skill is of uh, going out and doing, you know, multiple days or, or multiple stretches of trips to do some photo stuff or some outdoor travel stuff or whatever it might be. But it was kind of cool. So if you want to, uh, you can check out my website, billynewmanphoto.com. You can go to billynewmanphoto.com forward slash support to uh, help out this podcast. It's a value for value model where um, where if you're interested in uh, uh, what you've heard or you think you've received some value out of, uh, out of listening to some of the ideas or topics that I've talked about, uh, feel free to help me out and send me some money or something that is equivalent to the value that uh, that you feel like you got out of the podcast and stuff. You can check out uh, PayPal links at billynewmanphoto.com forward slash support. You can also use uh, Patreon if you're more interested in the uh, the format of that system. I know some people already have their Patreon systems uh, or, you know, Patreon payment system set up. So if you're more comfortable with that, patreon.com forward slash billynewmanphoto. Um, and what else is there going on? I think I got a couple other things uh, kind of working out. I'm trying to get the Night Sky podcast set up with uh, a bunch of information about some of the upcoming uh, conjunction to Saturn and Jupiter. That's going to be pretty cool on the 21st. Um, so I'm trying to put out a podcast uh, about that right away and then uh, trying to get a bunch of podcasts up for the rest of the year. 
so that uh, there's some information about some of the changes going on in the sky. Also trying to do a podcast about uh, some music stuff, too. I think that'd be kind of cool. Hey, the geese just took off. I think they're just kind of lifting up a couple hundred of them. Let's see if they'll take off over me. Looks like they're turning this way. I'm not sure if the mic's going to pick it up very well. But, uh, but yeah, trying to do a music podcast should be kind of cool. Working with Spotify Premium uh, to put out a playlist of songs that they have in their catalog and then uh, buttress that up against uh, some sections of me talking and reviewing some of the information about that album. But uh, trying to go through some of my, uh, my favorite albums uh, over of time, you know, of the, the music that's available and stuff. So trying to go through a, a bunch of albums, give a couple notes, and put that out as a show on Spotify. Now that you can do that sort of stuff, kind of cool. So you can check out the music listening sessions with Billy Newman on Spotify. But I think that should be everything. If you want to see uh, more stuff, go to BillyNewmanPhoto.com. And I think that should be a wrap until next week's podcast. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks. Bye.